There you are, once more. Welcome again, my friends. Let me be honest by saying that I am entirely aware that you already know what card I've drawn for this week. I know that when I get this episode to you, there has been a description written that includes the tarot card I pulled in order to determine the nature of this week's story. So I know that you know that I drew the Two of Cups again, but reversed. Please allow me to tell you my story first, this week. Before I discuss what this card means, I'm sure you can guess if you listened to last week's episode, or if you're familiar with the cards and their meanings. But, all the same, let us discuss this later. Please allow me also to insist that I shuffled the cards. I promise. I will never lie to you about this one thing. I will never, ever, ever peek and choose the card I wish to choose. I will never ever put back a card I've drawn because I don't like it, or because it's been used too recently. Why? Because that is the game. And I adore games. But also because I value truth too highly. There are some things here in this podcast that I am controlling and contriving. The magical dark forest in which I live, for one. My strange and monstrous appearance, for another. You understand. I have never kept the fact from you that this is fiction. It's simply that fiction is as real as anything else. If we want it to be. But I've told you this before. Forgive me. I'll continue. Yes, I drew the Two of Cups for the second week in a row. It was reversed. The Cups will not leave me alone. They never do. I've drawn the Ace of Cups four times, the Two of Cups twice now, and two plus two is four, which is relevant, I imagine. I've drawn the Four of Cups once, and the Ten of Cups. I have told you sixteen stories now, including this one. Half of those have been in the Suit of Cups. I will tell you more about the reversed Two of Cups later. In the meantime, let me remind you that it is indeed the time of year when the dead wake and the dead walk. We can't always see them. Not even me. Sometimes they take me by surprise. It is only when I decide to stop and look for them that I find them. And lately, I've found myself almost overwhelmed by how many of them I can find throughout my forest. I told you last time that me and my companion, the one who burns always, have been preparing the woods for their arrival. We have indeed. My burning one set up lanterns in the trees, torches along the pathways that lead to me. I have been clearing away the dead leaves and arranging them for my bed. They are where I like to sleep, for my skin is an elaborate patchwork of their colors, and my hair is a decadent mess of their textures. And I blend in perfectly, you see. So the floors of the forest are remarkably clean and smooth. I leave little offerings sometimes. Acorns, berries, apples, pumpkins which my friend of fire likes to hollow and light from within. He saw it somewhere, he told me, and he wanted to try it. He said it with a gleeful smile and I noticed it because it seemed so strange with his dimming light. His brightness has been lessened, you see. I've been noticing it. His breath is a bit more labored, and though his glow ebbs and flows with each inhale and exhale, 
That glow is weak now, which means I can see the husk of his body, the burnt wood of his skin that encases that magical fire. He is charred and it hurts, I can tell. The fire only faintly glows behind that skin which is not quite skin. I do not want him to leave. I would like him to stay here and light up this forest with me forever. But there is a growing chill in the air. The breeze is strong and harsh, and the rain is cold. And soon enough, I'm sure there will be snow. He will not be able to survive that. That is, if he can die. I don't think he can. I am speaking of him in the present tense because I find it difficult to believe that I am alone here again. But not long ago, earlier today in fact, he stood in the sunshine in the middle of the forest. He was bathing in the warmth, his eyes turned heavenward and closed, and he breathed in the sun. He knew I was watching. When he opened his eyes, they were not afraid, and indeed, he whispered three words to me. Don't be afraid. And he burst into a great flame, greater than I've seen him produce throughout the summer, throughout the beginning of this fall, a greater fire perhaps than I've ever seen with my own eyes. I wanted to look away, but I did not. All at once, he was turned to ash. Never mind what I did with him, but trust that I kept him safe. I collected him up, and I took him somewhere safe to rest for a while. Because everything has its cycle, and so too does the earth, so too does fire. And indeed, I trust in that cycle. And I think if I care for these ashes until he returns again, he will be happier and stronger next time. I was the strong one between the two of us, and oh, it felt very strange. It felt very good. Very good, that is, until I could really see just how weak he was. I've been blind to it until now, and then it was too late. Not that I could have prevented this. I must be more vigilant in the future. I must be truer to my friends. I still mourn his absence, but I can feel him. I feel him in the lanterns he left behind. I feel him in the torches he lined along my pathway. I think I shall see him again, when the season is right. Everything in its time. And now the woods are so silent that I cannot help but hear the whispers of ghosts. Well, some are ghosts. Others are... Phantoms, maybe. Phantoms of a past I remember vaguely and have left behind. The ghosts are people who, mostly, I have never met. People who have either found themselves in these woods before, in life, that is, or who found themselves here after death, because they wanted to return to the earth in spirit as well as in body. These ones are mostly harmless and sometimes wonderful. I first noticed them because I thought they were alive. A woman in white, her face covered by a veil. A little boy in his Sunday best, seeming like he had tiptoed out of church to chase a toad. An old man sitting on a stump, smoking a pipe that seemed to produce a strange yellow smoke. A huge black horse, wild and furious galloping between the trees and shrieking, only to name a few of my favorites. 
It is only when you look closely at them and realize that something is slightly amiss. Eyes without color. An unnoticed mortal wound. Feet that seem to hover just a little bit away from the ground as they step. That sort of thing. And once I notice these things, that is when they see me. That is when I appear to them. And I promise you, I am more frightening to them than they are to me. They are simply people. People who have passed and who, for whatever reason, remained. Perhaps by choice, perhaps not. But I... I am the chilly dew on the leaves and your breath in the air. I am the groan of the trees, the whisper of the wind. With my feet and hands and lips covered in bloody dirt, and my eyes reflecting the torchlight orange-red now, no longer bright and yellow and animal, with my skin that camouflages me in the brush until you look closer and notice that I've been there all along, with my hair that is entwined in little matted braids and includes little twigs twisted into figures, beautiful little rotting berries and dead leaves and decaying autumn loveliness. Sure, indeed, I am beautiful and horrific, but these ghosts are people, or animals, and those things are lovely too in their purity of spirit. In fact, I'm not frightened by them at all. I welcome them, and I require no tribute from them, only from the living. The dead may pass freely in my woods in this time of year. They deserve that and I am honored to give that to them. These, however, are ghosts. I was telling you about phantoms from my past, who are also here. For example, I was laying in the leaves just after my friend of fire disappeared, and I was watching the sky. The sky has been white-gray today, it isn't quite raining, but it is still wet and gray and heavy with mist. So much so that I can't see the clouds. Looking up to the sky, I saw the outline of three pairs of great white wings. Huge. I saw the glint of a sword, the shape of a staff. Plummeting down toward the ground, towards me. Looking in my eyes, these beautiful creatures, angels I'm almost certain, came at me with weapons drawn, giving out a terrible battle cry. I didn't flinch. I am impermeable. And indeed, as they hit the ground, they disappeared. The force of these imaginary things may have cleared the leaves from their neat pile that is my bed. But they were imaginary all the same. Later today I went for a walk towards the little lake here. I remembered how my fiery friend had submerged himself here so that I could be closer to him, even though it pained him. And the memory both pained and comforted me. But as I looked down into the water, I saw another creature looking up at me. A creature with a cloak that was actually broken wings hanging behind his back. Decorated with barnacles and seaweed and even pearls. Also in his long hair that seemed colorless now, but that I knew was meant to be red as rubies. He was smiling serenely. And when I dipped my toe in the lake, disturbing the surface of the water with expanding ripples, he too disappeared. There was a hunter, too, who I saw. 
once a human man, handsome and strong and volatile and overpassionate, but now listless and empty, it seemed. He refused to see me. The others looked in my eyes, but the hunter... The hunter kept his eyes forward and walked until he disappeared. I called out to him, because I loved him, and that love still remains despite it all, and it will always remain. But he faded away into the mist all the same. Because he had to. Because he has such a vast capacity for cruelty. He cannot help it. And he hates it about himself. But he cannot help that he is cruel. And I do not allow cruelty in my woods. The sight of him disappearing made me weep even still, but it has to be. Perhaps in time he will learn to change. But until then, he cannot be welcome. I am not apologetic, but I am sorry for it. And the last one, the last phantom from my past. Of course we know who it was. Tall, tall, tall as anything. Overly tall. Thin, gaunt, hungry, for who knows what. Black eyes, shark's eyes, shark's eyes. He bowed an overly elegant bow to me. He saw me. He grinned a terrible grin with shark's teeth, too. But this is where I knew something was amiss. You are not who you were. You became warm. You became gentle. You became kind, and then you erupted into flame to be reborn later from the ashes, since everything has its cycle, and I must simply be patient. So this? This is a memory. This is a memory of what I thought I loved. I thought I loved darkness and nightmares and things that are sharp and cruel. When in truth, I love life, and I love warmth. I simply know how to live with the shadows, and that is important. I did not bow back, but he smiled anyway. And that is when I realized that he was looking past me, behind me. I turned around. And there she was, right in front of me, all in black, bloodless and frightening and gorgeous and empty. Black eyes, too, shark's teeth, too, just like he who made her. She had bowed in return to him, smiling viciously. I looked at the two of them and I realized I was caught between them. Caught between what I used to love and what I used to be. And I looked around, and I saw those innocent, naive ghosts that were once human or animal, once living. Spirits of the dead who I have been making a warm and loving home for this month before the winter comes and it is too cold for them. With magical firelight from my friend, now gone, my friend who loved me and my stories more than anything. When they saw these two nightmarish beasts, they shook, they cowered, they wept, they ran, they hid. For they knew that these things bring death and decay, and even ghosts love life. Perhaps especially ghosts love life. 
their fear broke my heart, and I felt guilt for what I once was. I keep telling you that I am new and I am leaving the old story behind. My old season has passed and this is the new one, but that's not quite true, is it? Though I've kept what I want to keep from that experience with me, I haven't yet been able to leave behind me what I do not want to follow behind me. I think it is time. I called out so loud that my woods trembled with the strength of my voice. These are my woods. My word is law. In my woods you must bring only peace or you will be denied safe passage. Here I bring life. Here I bring light. Here I bring warmth. And I banish nightmares. I need you to be gone. I need you to be gone. And the two of them monstrous and beautiful but gleefully vicious, too, opened their mouths in a silent moan, and they simply disappeared. What I thought I was, and what I thought I loved, disappeared. And I remained with grateful ghosts at sunset. When the sun had fallen, the lamplight made the woods red and orange and warm and kind, just like my friend who is now a pile of ash, but will not always be, for fire can always be brought back. The two of cups, when it is reversed, is disharmony, imbalance, a cycle of pain and strife and imbalance and discord between two people that must result in a break in that relationship. It is a separation, an ending. I pulled it because I asked the cards what I need to remember this week. I'm leaving it behind. That toxic cycle of longing, wanting, abandoning, fighting, loving a little, then longing, wanting, abandoning, fighting, Again and again and again. I'm done with it. I am a champion of life. I am a champion of light. I am a champion of warmth. And so are you, I think. And in my woods, I welcome what I want to welcome and I leave behind what does not serve me, or you, my friend. I am not alone. You are here, and you will be safe here with me. Next time it will be near to All Hallow Tide again, the third All Hallow Tide in which you've known me. I must keep preparing. Until then, good night, my friends. Hello everyone, and thank you once again for joining me on tonight's episode of On a Dark Cold Night. I hope you've been doing well and taking care of yourselves. This is Kristen Zaza, the writer, host, podcaster, performer, and composer behind the podcast. This has been episode 116, 16 episodes into season 2. I know that I've already harped on this idea of the cards being stubborn sometimes, especially the suit of cups which has always been the case with me and my readings. However, I know that it's a reflection on my own stubbornness, so 
I'll work on that for next time. I'm already excited to see what I draw for next week's episode. If you're interested in supporting On a Dark Cold Night, a great way to do so is to become a monthly patron on patreon.com, where every supporter receives access to my constantly updated soundtrack of the show. You can find out more at patreon.com slash darkcoldnight. If you'd like to help out through a one-time donation instead and aren't interested in the soundtrack, you can do so through coffee.com at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. And as always, there are also t-shirts and hoodies for the show available at bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. I'm sending a big thank you this week to an iTunes listener from the U.S. who left us a lovely five-star review. Their name is Macy Spencer. Thanks so much for taking the time to help spread the word, Macy Spencer. I really appreciate it. Leaving a review for the show is a great way to support what I do in a completely non-financial way. So if you have the time and inclination, please feel free to leave a rating and a review for the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, or anywhere else you like. If you want to keep up to speed with what I've got going on for the show, please feel free to follow me on Twitter at A Dark Cold Night, Instagram at Dark Cold Night Podcast, or via my Facebook or YouTube pages, both called On A Dark Cold Night. Well, thank you again for listening in tonight, my friends. I'm saying goodbye to the Two of Cups, with the knowledge that maybe it'll be back again for some reason. It's best not to try to predict or control it. Maybe something that 2020 has taught me. We can only manage our reactions and our own actions to things and all that, right? Anyway, because I mean it deeply, and in honor of the Two of Cups, I'll say it twice each. Thank you, thank you. Be well. Be well. Good night. Good night. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.